so uh, let's go ahead and dive right into this uh, ASIC repair. Hope you guys are ready. This is a little more advanced stuff. Um, let's get started. We already kind of went over the morning recap. Yeah, so uh, your PCB is your printed circuit board. Um, it could be your hash board, your control board, uh, your power supply has one. Um, these are the basic uh, components that you'll see, the different symbols as well that are gonna be on the board. So you can actually look and see uh, what actual um, kind of component it is uh, based upon the symbols. Um, they'll also have different numbering and stuff like that. Uh, the first one here obviously is a capacitor uh, that basically holds a charge for you, uh, stores the energy, and uh, basically stabilizes the frequency. Um, then we got a diode, it's basically like a one-way circuit. Uh, prevents the voltage from backflowing, causing uh, damage. Um, we also have inductors, uh, kind of similar, um, but it's more like a water wheel in a sense. So it kind of keeps the energy going in a magnetic field, and uh, that continues the flow even after the power is shut off. So it'll just continue until that uh, charge is, is gone. Um, and you got uh, resistors. Um, they basically, as the word is, it basically uh, restricts the current flow. Um, then you got like specialty chips. Um, those are usually like the U and Q chips. Uh, most of these components are all SMD, so they're surface mount devices. Um, so we'll actually go over all the tools and everything for uh, how to basically uh, reflow and stuff like that, all these components. Now here's some examples of uh, some of the chips, the different symbols you might see on the actual PCB. Um, these aren't all related to uh, hash boards, just to give you an example. But uh, as you can see, you know, those uh, center ones there, those are the different sizes of uh, components we use from capacitors, resistors, diodes, stuff like that. And as you can see, they get small to even the size of like a grain of sand. So um, that's why we have different uh, tools that we use to help uh, make that a lot easier to work with. So now we're gonna go into the different main circuits of a hash board. Um, obviously, uh, we're gonna go from um, where the power comes in all the way to basically the ASIC chip. Uh, so it starts off with the power coming in from the power supply. It usually has a little power rail uh, with some capacitors, different other components, um, a really basic circuit uh, that powers all the other circuits. Uh, you usually will see like just capacitors in that circuit. And then you also have uh, the IO data circuit or the IO data port. And that's basically where it connects to the control board. And uh, not only does it supply the data, uh, the IO stands for input output. So it uh, sends and receives the data. It also powers uh, the hash board with some voltage as well. Um, once we get into some of the other circuits, you'll see kind of where that flows to. But yeah, this is basically what sends out the program to the hash board and uh, it reports back to the control board um, given uh, after running all the algorithm and basically reporting back out to mm -hmm. the blockchain. Yeah, so this is uh, right here. You have your power cable. Can't really see it. It's on the left there. It's your six pin. Um, so this would be from like a S9 or L3. Some of the older models used uh, the PCIe cables. Um, 
But as you can see, all the small components above the I.O. data port there, um, as well as that terminal, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So that pretty much uh, has to do with uh, the PIC circuit, that little port that we showed. I can go back real quick. We'll also see another photo. But uh, those five uh, ports right there is what we use. And it uh, basically the PIC circuit is what uh, controls the control board, all the hash chips, all the domains. It's what uh, opens up the circuits, closes the circuits. If something's going wrong with the board, it'll shut it off. Um, it basically is kind of um, the uh, nervous system, if you will, of the whole system. Um, it also, you know, basically sends and receives the heartbeat signal. Uh, which we'll kind of talk about a little bit later. Um, and the PIC circuit usually controls uh, what's called the DC to DC circuit. Um, so we'll either turn it on or off. Uh, it's one of those circuits it controls. Um, so going into the actual DC to DC circuit. Uh, But yeah, going back into the uh, DC to DC circuit, that's a circuit that um, steps down the voltage. So voltage will come in for like the L3, for example, 12 volts comes in. And then the DC to DC circuit, after opening up, drops the voltage down to 10 volts. So this uh, is what basically powers the rest of the control board from there. Um, Yeah, and so the uh, DC to DC circuit's main component would definitely be the uh, buck diode. That's the actual chip that drops the voltage down. And um, you also have the MOS chips as well. So that's basically what regulates the uh, voltage coming out of the power rail um, and basically shuts on and off. That's kind of like the switch. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Like, uh, but yeah, there's also on it, almost every single board, you'll notice this really big inductor that's on there. Uh, that's pretty much um, what helps keep that uh, voltage flowing um, after the MOS chips. Um, and then obviously it's filtered through some more conductors, uh, or capacitors rather, and then uh, it goes on to uh, some other circuits that we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, so here's some photos of those circuits. Uh, you have the PIC chip there on the left, uh, right here, and um, it pretty much consists of you know, different capacitors and resistors. Uh, And uh, it doesn't look very clear right here, but you can actually read on the chip what the actual name of that chip is. Um, not all chips will show you exactly what it is. They'll have like a, a parts code. Um, but yeah, right here is uh, one DC to DC. This is a different version of a DC to DC. I believe this is from an S9. This is an L3. Um, sometimes they uh, use very similar components. Um, so after the pick chip right here, it comes through and comes uh, to this um, triode right here, comes out the voltage, opens up your buck diode, your voltage comes through the MOS chips and out to your uh, next circuit, which is the boost, uh, boost circuit. And that's what steps up the voltage from there. So for like the L3, for example, it goes from that 12 to 10 volts in the DC to DC. And then from there, the boost jumps it back up to 14 volts. Um, the, boost, uh, the boost circuit actually uh, usually 
powers all the last uh, few domains. Just depends on the model of the board. Um, for the L3, uh, the boost powers the last two domains. Um, You also have what powers your clock signal. We'll talk about all the signals in a, a little bit here. But uh, you have your um, clock crystal oscillator, uh, and that's usually at a 25 megahertz. Uh, and that's what powers basically the clock. It's what sets the frequency of the board. It's what the board pretty much runs off of, uh, one of the most important um, signals to look out for. So right here we have uh, the boost circuit. This is uh, your voltage regulator. That's what actually uh, steps up your voltage. Uh, it goes through this diode right here and out to the last few domains. Uh, you also have an inductor right here. So right here you have a clock crystal. Um, it's right next to this LDO, which we'll talk about in a minute. But that's what powers your clock signal. And uh, most boards have uh, anywhere from like two, it can have multiples. Um, what's miners have a whole bunch of them. So now uh, we have the uh, LDOs, which are the low dropout voltage regulators. Uh, basically, that's what splits the voltage out into each domain or row of uh, ASIC hash chips. Um, as we mentioned, the last few LDOs usually are powered by the boost. Uh, the rest are usually powered directly from uh, either the power rail or from the DC to DC circuit. Um, and these are uh, what regulates the power signals, um, you know, throughout the entire domains. Uh, if one of them goes out, pretty much the entire domain will go out, uh, disrupting all the signals, depending upon what LDO it is. Uh, most boards have either one or two LDOs per uh, domain, and that's what controls the actual signals that go through the chips. Then you have what's called the temperature sensor. So uh, usually you'll have anywhere from two to uh, one to four temperature sensors. Uh, L3 has only one temperature sensor. Um, newer models usually have four, two for the intake, two for the exhaust. Uh, there's also a temperature sensor on each ASIC chip as well. Um, some models also have their own LDO on the actual ASIC chip. So sometimes, like the S9s, they don't even have a boost circuit. They just pass the voltage straight through and use the internal LDOs to uh, power those chips in the domain. Um, But the temperature uh, sensor data uh, goes from uh, the last chip to the first chip through all of the temperature sensors, uh, through the chips as well as the actual sensor chips themselves, all the way back to the first chip through the return signal. And that return signal goes back to the control board and uh, communicates with it, telling it what the temperatures are, what all of, uh, is going on with the actual board. So here's some photos. On the left here, we have the LDOs. You can see two of them. This is from uh, L3. And on the right here, we have the temperature sensor. It's that eight pin. Are they usually labeled with the 88 for the RX-205? Uh, well, the temperature sensors, you can actually tell um, which one they are by the label on the hash board. Um, you can also sometimes buy the actual chip. Uh, different 
hash boards, different models, use different chips. Just depends on the actual board itself. Even different versions will be different chips they use, even on the same submodel. Yeah, so obviously we've got to talk about the ASICs. It's the main components of the whole uh, hash board. Uh, it's all the ASICs are connected in series, um, so they go through the domains from first chip to last chip. And then there's that one signal usually that goes back to the uh, beginning of the whole uh, ASIC chain. Usually you'll have two or more ASICs in that domain. And uh, the direction of the domains uh, is also design, uh, dependent upon the design of the actual hash board. So each model, the voltage flows differently on the board. It can go straight up and down. It can zigzag. Just uh, depends on how they decided to design the board. And the LDOs are what powers those signals on the ASICs. Um, Now there's a lot of capacitors and resistors in between those ASIC hash chips and they're usually really small, some of the smallest components on the board. So it's very difficult when uh, reflowing or working with ASICs, uh, you gotta watch out for those really small components. Uh, you can easily knock one of them away or uh, the air gun can just blow it away. You won't even actually see it, so you just gotta pay attention. Yeah, you can take uh, take either a new part or a used part and install it if it went missing. This is a picture of an ASIC. This is some of the older models like the S9, the L3. They all use a black glue instead of solder paste um, to actually hold the heat sinks on. So this one's a thermal activated uh, glue. So as you heat the heat sink, it activates the glue and it, it solidifies. And to remove. Thermal conductivity is on, on, like say on an S9. Uh, Three watts per MK. Or, I'm sorry, I'm not. Yeah, we we have some time for for questions at the end, so. Uh, But yeah, this is the uh, ASIC has chip here. Um, the heat sinks are what is attached to it, and there's usually another heat sink on the bottom. L3s are kind of uh, one of those ones that don't have a heat sink on the bottom, um, but you usually have to remove that first before uh, you can remove the actual ASIC chip. Uh, now we're gonna go over uh, quickly here uh, how the uh, hash bore signal flows again. Um, so the voltage comes in through that power rail, you know, usually between 12 and 21 volts, just depending on the hash board. And uh, the control board also supplies power to the hash board as well, um, as receives the return signal. And uh, sometimes it has a step down voltage, which is controlled by the pick, the DC to DC. Uh, the pick controls that voltage. It's also what controls the frequency of all the chips of those domains. So when you go into the firmware and you change all the frequencies and stuff, that's what's going on. Uh, the pick actually changes those um, to the different voltages that you're looking for. Uh, the pick controls, uh, or um, some, some versions of the boards, uh, like the newer models, have uh, an EEPROM. So usually that data on the older models was just stored in the pick, but now they actually have a separate EEPROM chip that um, it includes the actual serial number of the board. So um, if you're trying to like swap boards 
sometimes that can be an issue because of that uh, serial number uh, being on the EEPROM. So from there, uh, the voltage from the DC to DC circuit goes to the boost circuit, just depends on the board. Um, and that's usually what powers the LDOs in the last domain. Each domain usually has one or two LDOs um, powering the ASIC hash chips. Uh, the reason for that is, is that we have two different signals uh, and we'll cover them here in a second. Chips are arranged uh, in domains, and um, for each of the hash board models, they flow differently. So from the LDOs, uh, you have uh, usually two different voltages, and that's either uh, 0.8 volts or 1.8 volts. So the newer models, they actually put two LDOs on there, one that controls the uh, 0.8 voltage and one that controls the 1.8. Um, on the L3s, for example, there's uh, one complete row that actually has uh, 2.6 volts. So you just gotta uh, check your actual hash board. It's good to actually have a working board to compare to. So that way you can actually test all the different test points, see what the voltages are, what the resistances are, and uh, compare that to the board you're working on. Uh, there's usually somewhere between five and seven actual signals uh, that you can test, and they have test points on the actual hash board next to each hash chip. And all the signals uh, go from first chip to last chip, uh, except for that one return signal that goes from the last chip to the first chip. And that's what carries all the temperature data and all the other data back to the control board. One of the signals is produced by the uh, clock crystal oscillator. Uh, another one is usually zero volts, and that's the heartbeat signal supplied by the PIC chip. And most boards also have a reset and a, a command or receive signal. So here's an amp miner hash board uh, test points. You have five. Now the names are actually uh, different depending upon the model you're working on, but they try to get it more simplified. So they would call it like RI, RO, which is just input output. And now they actually just put RX to make it a little more simpler for everybody. Um, and that RI signal is usually uh, 1.8 volts. Your clock is at 0 0.8 volts. Usually it's uh, plus or minus about 0 0.1 volts. You have your command input output that's also 1.8 volts. It's your CO is usually more common. Uh, your RI signal is your return signal, or your RO signal. It's the respond input output. Uh, your BI or BO is your uh, response busy input output, and that's what also is your zero volts most of the time. It just sends a heartbeat, so you'll actually see it spike for a quick second, and then it'll go back down to zero. If it's not at zero, then you actually uh, most likely have a short in the board that's causing it to um, overflow voltage onto that signal. Yeah, so um, the BI or BX, BO signal, 
that's uh, what's um, your heartbeat signal. So most of the time it's a zero volts, but while you're testing it, you'll see it kind of give a spike real quick. Um, and that's why it's called a heartbeat signal. And if it's uh, not at zero volts, let's say there's voltage, usually it'll be like 1.8 because the voltage is coming from one signal over. He accidentally put too much solder on there and it's um, causing that short. So now instead of it being zero volts, it's just constantly like around that 1.8 volts. And here's the uh, test points, the different signals for what's minors. It's very similar. They also got uh, five test points. Now the return signal on this one's actually TXD. It's the transmit signal. The voltages are actually identical. They also have the same heartbeat signal. It comes from CTSI. That's your chip selection. It's also got the same reset signal. So yeah, now we're gonna go into basically common faults of a hash board. So one of the main uh, and most common uh, problems that you'll find with A6 is that'll be zero A6. What that basically means is when you go onto your firmware, you actually will see that the chain's missing um, and that's basically a disruption of that return signal. So somewhere along that circuit from last chip to first chip, that signal went out. It could be the circuits that supply that power, like the boost, uh, the DC to DC. It could be the LDOs. It could be the chips. It could be anything in between the chips. So it's pretty much could be anything. And you want to go ahead and go through all the different, uh, test points, make sure that they're all showing the proper voltages, all the proper resistances. Now you also have uh, one sometimes will show some ASICs. So instead of it showing for L3 72 chips, it'll actually go ahead and show like 69 chips. And so what usually that is, is that there's a disruption of a different signal, not the return signal. Uh, most likely that return signal is, is uh, at a good value because it's showing ASICs. Otherwise, uh, it'd probably say zero ASIC. So basically you want to go from the first chip to the last chip, trying to find where that signal actually stops. Usually you want to check your clock and your RI signals. The only time that you're really checking the uh, BX signal, the heartbeat signal, is to make sure that there's not a short But basically, you're just looking for any kind of abnormalities uh, in the chips, the voltages. So here's a full test kit. Has uh, your anti-static mat. Most importantly, you want to have your rework station. Now you can use a control board or a test fixture. You don't always have to have a test fixture. And uh, you definitely need a power supply. You usually want to use the power supply that the unit actually runs on. Now, depending upon what kind of board you're working on, you usually want to use the same uh, adhesive for the heat sinks. Um, you have the black glue, solder paste, uh, thermal grease. Um, another important material is flux and solder. Now, I know those have to be very accurate, right? Um, 
Yeah, there's also uh, Yeah, so um, there's different uh, temperatures of like the solder paste, for example. Um, the black glue is kind of generic. Uh, kind of got to look around. Uh, we also offer that. Um, all the replacement parts as well. ASIC master. <laughs> Dot com. <laughs> but yeah, some of the other specialty tools, these aren't really necessary, but that would be the hashboard code editor. Probably shouldn't be talking about that, but uh, <laughs> um, you also got your oscilloscope, uh, your anti-static mat, gloves, safety glasses, uh, all your PPEs. Just want to make sure you're safe. Yeah, you can use the hashboard uh, code editor to change, um, not supposed to do it, but change like the serial number on the board so that way it'll run. Uh, uh, it's actually not on there. Um, let me see, I actually got it here somewhere. But yeah, I'll, be, I'll show you during the demonstration a little bit later today. And that pretty much brings us to the Q&A. All right. Yeah, if you guys want to come up to the mics. Uh, just quick, that heartbeat signal, zero volts, is there a frequency associated with that? Uh, depends on the board. I think it's probably around 0.6 volts. I'm the frequency at all. Hertz. Uh, well, um, not a hundred percent sure on that one. Okay. Yeah, not all boards actually use a pick chip. They all use different uh, chips depending upon the board. What what voltage do the chips actually run at? What voltage or? Yeah, yeah. like for the, the the main like the ASIC units. Yeah, they usually run on one point eight and point eight volts. Okay. And, and they typically run at what megahertz or? Uh, well, the clock is bit, runs off of 25 megahertz. Okay. And that sometime is modified when you're like overclocking or underclocking or what? How, how, what, what? When you overclock them, what are you changing? What's the? Yeah, so I mean, you're changing the frequencies and the voltages of all the different chips, the different oh. domains. Uh -huh. Depends on the firmware, but. But it's that 25 megahertz signal that go, that changes, or that's constant, and there's something. That's else. constant. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Uh, I have three. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Uh, so uh, the firmware is uh, what is that stored like on a chip on the uh, control board? Like what? you know how there's a hard drive in a computer that you know the operating system is on the hard drive, right, or SSD. But on an ASIC machine, like where is the storage at or the firmware located? Like yeah, so or? that's uh, the, all the programming is stored in the PIC chip and oh, the it's EPROM. Oh, the PIC chip? Okay. On the hash board. And how do people safely take off the metal heat sinks from, say, like an S9? Is there a yeah, so like an S9 uh, is a good example. It has the black glue on the top of the heat sink. And it has the um, solder on the bottom that actually attaches to the PCB. So you'd remove the top heat sink first. And like just by sheer force? I'm no, sure not. Like, of course. Yeah, you, you add you add uh, heat to it, usually around okay, so 450, like a pad, a heat pad or 450 something. or less, like 350 to 450. Really depends on your environment. Um, some places are hotter, some places are colder, so you have to adjust the temperature so based upon gonna, your environment. So if I went online, like, what would I search for? Like a, uh, you know, just a rework type. station. We also offer those. Oh, you guys have them too? Okay, sweet, sweet. Um, 
so on the S19 Pro, um, on the side where you can unscrew the heat sink, this is my last question, by the way, sorry guys. Um, now, is that thermal paste that's uh, covering the chips? Or Correct. Or is that like glue or a combination? Correct. So like the stages went from, they used the black glue on the heat sinks. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they started using it's solder like paste. Kinda. The problem with that, it caused a whole bunch of like solder ball issues, a whole bunch of shorting went out because huh. the solder would overflow onto the actual circuits of all the legs and stuff. So then they upgraded even further to do like heat plates where they used uh, thermal grease. They still use solder and heat sinks on the bottom like the S19s, for example. Um, there's just a lot more chips. Um, so what would you suggest if, if I was refurbishing an S19? What would you suggest to use uh, in replacement of these um, uh, heat, uh, the heat sink gel? Yeah, so the S19s use high temp solder and uh, you'd use a thermal grease to put the heat sink, the heat plates back on. But you said the, the one that comes like with it, like factory fresh, right? Is, there's been problems with it, right? So is there a better alternative than using like there's a few different there. options out there, different thermal greases. You can even do, uh, you know, thermal pads. Hmm. Lots of other different options out there. Do you guys have them on the website? Oh, uh, we have some of the materials, yes. Okay, sweet. Thanks, man. Hi. By the way, I understood everything you just talked about. I'm ready to go rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> Not even close. Uh, <laughs> Instead of going through all the details as a, as a, as a layman, if you will, like how, how do I maybe diagnose or help diagnose some of the problems and if the machine needs to be sent in to you? How, how would one go about, I, I can't get into all that detail, it's just not feasible for me, uh, I think. Totally understand. Uh, you know, is, is there a way to just use a, a tenth of that toolkit and just diagnose a problem and then I can tell you and then you could, you know what I mean? Like how, how do we communicate that as a? As yeah, a, we as actually a, offer a diagnostic kit um, so you can just do like testing the basic voltages and stuff like that. If you were here during the morning session, we kind of talked about how you can use the firmware to diagno diagnose it, um, help troubleshoot it as well, try to fix it yourself before you actually send it out to a repair shop or attempt to repair yourself. Um, yeah. Any other questions or? I think we're almost out of time. Uh, could you tell us about like the kind of the kind of like the similar tools you would need to uh, repair the dashboard? Can you talk in the mic, please? Uh, sorry, uh, can you talk about like the seminal tools uh, uh, to fix uh, an ASIC and like maybe uh, some of the tools that are not used as much but sometimes can be used if necessary? Yeah, that's actually what we're doing in the next uh, advanced section. So. Yeah, stick around. <laughs> I was looking online about this guy talking about replacing one type of chip with a different uh, newer revision chip. Is it possible to, to do that with different miners where you can maybe increase performance or reliability using different, swapping out chips for a different, different chip? Like an ASIC chip? Yeah. Uh, I mean, technically not. <laughs> yeah, it's not really. <laughs> They all use different uh, pinouts sometimes. They got really smart about that. So they actually switched the circuit leads between the different models, make it almost impossible to do that. Well, what about revisions within the same chip? Is that when, like, let's say you have a miner that's, you're repairing one that's two or three years old and they don't make, they make a newer revision of that same chip. Does that, is that something that's worthwhile doing or is that something that, or are you, are you able to actually find like, I'm, you know, I'm talking about like batch numbers on chips and stuff like that. And I was just wondering if you're, <laughs> yeah. if, there's um, any, if there's any Yeah, I mean like usually the, use usually the first uh, batches are usually the best uh, chips. Okay. Uh, batch one. Um, okay, thank yeah, you. The, the way batches kind of work is, is when you print out a whole bunch of chips, they just print them out on a factory and 
when they come out, they kind of test them and they're like, okay, this chip is the best performance av overall. These are in this category. So. Yeah, there's. Yeah, so they do have. Uh, uh, it's more new, but they have a socket you can use that you can put the ASIC chip in, and test out, uh, you know, the different signals all at once versus having to do it, which is basically impossible, you know, with your multimeter. Um, uh, well, it's kind of new. Um, it's really hard to get and find, so I don't even think it, you know, you have to have a separate control board and stuff for it that they don't sell with it. And it's, uh, yeah. Hot stuff. Um, how, if you're setting up an, a newer operation and you know that some machines are going to go bad, uh, typically, you, I think, you, I'm guessing you would keep around some dead unit. Like, if a unit goes bad, you keep it to cannibalize parts, right? And yeah, it's very common. Very common, and so the, the larger parts, parts are kind of the larger parts are kind of obvious. But how granular do you get in cannibalizing? Do you pull stuff off a board, and and place place it on, a, on, a, on another board that you're repairing, or it's actually just... a great way to do practice uh -huh. as well. Okay, so so you can get down to the part le the, the component level on the boards and and start. Yeah, you just want to make sure most likely it's the same version. Yeah. But even that, sometimes it might be a little bit different of a chip. But you just want to make sure that the component you're switching out is okay. what it is. Right. Yes, sir. What, uh, what kind of device are you using to remove the heat sink off of the heat gun or a hot plate or what? Yeah, so it just depends on... Um, Uh, well, actually reworking those kind of boards, they actually have a heat plate on the bottom that they glue on, so it's not just one, a bunch of different heat sinks. So you usually don't even remove that back plate, you just put it on like a, uh, an actual heat plate and then just rework the chips that way. Did you have to remove that huge heat sink off the Yeah, they screw off on the front. Got to give it a little nudge. <laughs> yeah. Kind of get a little wedge underneath there. Same thing with the S19s. Yeah, I don't know if you're talking about the back side with like the conformal, you know, glue. Um, that you'd have to, you know, um, heat up and a lot of different stuff that you have to learn for sure. Um, uh, what's your cleaning procedure when you receive any hash boards? Um, do you guys sonic clean or, uh, and then also, are you, or is that something we'll touch on later? Uh, I don't think we'll be quite covering that. I think we actually took out like the ultrasonic cleaner kind of stuff. Um, well, they're de technically the same water. They're both pure water. But um, yeah, for ultrasonic cleaners, there's different solutions you can buy to add as additives to the, you know, pure water. Um, but as far as like the cleaning processes, um, basically we start with, you know, dusting out the unit. Um, maybe even just depends on if the warranty is still there. Uh, you know, pull the, pull the hash boards out, clean them individually, 
Um, you can also, it depends on if there's like corrosion or stuff like that. We generally don't even use the ultra, ultrasonic cleaner unless we absolutely, you know, have to because um, it dirties up that solution. And, uh, yeah, do not use any kind of tap water or hard water. It'll ruin your unit. Um, but yeah, uh, you can use the ultrasonic cleaner. Um, usually we just use like a dust brush, like a paint brush or uh, toothbrushes and uh, some uh, alcohol, 99% isopropyl. A uh, quick question, for those messing with like with old hardware and stuff like that, have you seen any benefits in switching out for larger heat sinks, for example? Uh, like are the current heat sinks like sort of perfectly optimized for what they're, what they're working with. Is there any benefit in your mind to, to playing around with adding, attaching larger heat Are sinks? Are you talking the about like those 17 heat sinks that yeah, like, big like, plate like, that you just remove all the heat sinks? Yeah, exactly, like larger, larger, wider, wider breath to, to sort of dissipate the heat more or better and that kind of thing. If you're messing around with old hardware anyway, does it make sense if you've seen any benefits in, in messing with larger heat sinks in that, in that capacity? Well, yeah, if it's a better design, for sure. Um, it also makes it convenient to be able to, you know, just remove one plate versus 114. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hope we're uh, ready to start doing some more advanced stuff. So, yeah, we brought a um, L3 unit here to start testing. And so the first thing we're going to do is, is um, since it's an older model, we're going to go ahead and flash it to make sure, you know, if there's any viruses or stuff like that, it's on the firmware we want and the current version. So the first thing you want to do is disconnect everything from the control board. You unplug the data cables. You need to remove these anyways to insert the SD card. The only thing you want connected is the power. Now I got this SD card here. So we're just gonna insert it. Now depending on the control board you're using, like the S9, you have to move a jumper pin on J4. And so in order to do that, you just move that jumper pin over so that way, um, when you insert the SD card, it actually flashes the control board. And then once it's flashed, you go ahead and uh, switch that jumper back over. So now we have the SD card inserted and we also have uh, the power cable is the only thing connected. So we're gonna go ahead and power it on. Let's disconnect the ETH. So first these will flash at us and then the red light will start blinking. Kind of depends on the actual control board. Sometimes both lights flash at you. That generally takes about a minute or two. Yeah, so we're just flashing the firmware, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, find the IP. We're going to log into it. It's recommended. That way the fans don't run and everything. The power, the power is not going to the hash boards, that kind of stuff. Uh, not necessarily. What about 
You do have to remove two of them on this L3 control board to be able to access the port, so. Uh, on the S9, you have to move that jumper pin over to be able to flash. And as you can see, it's flashing the red light, so that needs to flash at least three times to confirm that it's actually been flashed. Now you can go ahead and just power it off by disconnecting it. It's also what we call a hard reset. You want to make sure that the power supply completely turns off as well, so the power goes all the way through it, and there's no more power. You can hear the fan still going, and there it stops. So now we're going to go ahead and remove the SD card. This would be the same process as doing stock firmware as well as uh, third party. So now we'll go ahead and reconnect all the cables. Plug in the Ethernet cable. You want to make sure that all the connections are nice and tight. And so everything's now plugged in. And you just power back on. Now there's many ways to find the actual IP address. There's a lot of softwares out there. You can use like an advanced IP scanner. Uh, I like using like an IP reporter. We'll go ahead and open that up. And so with this, you can actually uh, kind of organize it and it saves the logs so you can actually put what shelf and step it's on, that kind of stuff. Save the log for later. So you hit the start button. You want to make sure that this thing completely boots up. Don't want to forget to plug in the fans. <laughs> Don't forget to thank the Kalahari for the <laughs> Yeah, thank you Kalahari for the electricity and the ethernet. So usually the L3 has a blue light that turns on. Once that blue light turns off, then it starts going into uh, already configured everything. So once that's done, we can go ahead. There's an IP report button here. So you just hit that button and it just pops up on your screen. Now you can actually see what the IP address is. So you just come to your browser. You type in the IP address. And now you type in the password and your username. For Bitmain, it's root root all lowercase. So uh, as you can see at the top here, this is Hive on. Oh, that would be IP reporter right here. So we can take a look at the kernel log.
All right, so as we can see here, uh, we have the different chains. And we can also see how many ASICs each chain has. Now we're going to go ahead and go to the miner configuration. It's already preset, so you're mining for Bitmain right now. So you want to go ahead and change it. You just go to your regular pool. You just uh, copy and paste the URL. And then you just name your miner. Guess I could show you a pool for an example. So there's lots of pools out there. Uh, this is just one of them. And so as you can see here, this is for your Bitcoin uh, address to start mining. But we have Litecoin. So you just copy it over. Now you can also use different pools. You don't have to use the same pool. So usually what you have is, is at the beginning is, is how you uh, connect it to the pool and then there's a period. After the period, you can either use numbers, letters to kind of distinguish what the miner is. So you can do numbers or letters, whatever you want. And of course, if you have different pools, your uh, worker name is going to be different. Then all you have to do is, is just hit the save and apply button. And this would be the first thing you want to do once you receive a miner is change this uh, miner general configuration. Now we'll go ahead and go into the miner status. As you can see, it just rebooted, so there's nothing showing. It takes about a minute or two for it to boot up. can always hit the refresh uh, button. All right, there we have it. Usually takes a few minutes for it to uh, boot up and fully run. Now, if you notice down here, we're actually missing a board. We're actually physically missing the board, so it's not there. But usually if it wasn't showing, that would be a case of like zero ASIC. So it's starting to warm up. We can see the temperatures here. We can see the fan speeds. The number of ASICs each board is showing. What frequency each board is. Now if we want to, we can go ahead and do auto tuning. So you go into the configuration and you can set it to whatever frequency you want. And uh, conveniently you can do it by whatever hash power you're looking for. So let's go ahead and overclock it a little bit beyond regular stock. So after you change that setting, of course, you just hit save and run. Now we can go into the manual chip frequency and we can actually see all the chips. Of course, it's restarting right now, so it's going to say zero. Uh, 
It uh, generally takes about a minute or two for a reboot. And then when it's doing auto-tuning, like if you just plugged into your machine, even stock firmware has auto-tuning. So it will just run through that auto-tune real quick. That's why you'll see like the, uh, the amount of hashing power kind of change. All the different settings are kind of leveling out, if you will. All right, so we got it over uh, overclock now. Now you can see the different hardware errors that are showing up. You can also come back to the manual chip frequency. You can also show how many are showing hardware errors. Of course, it's still auto tuning right now. Tune is running. So you'd want to wait for that whole auto tune to finish before you start manually tuning the chips. You can either do it in groups, however many hardware errors are showing. You can change the frequency by different numbers. And then you can also show the chips that are showing those hardware errors. So here's one already. But auto-tuning is going to try to fix that. If it doesn't, then we can come in here and slowly change the frequencies down or up. And uh, slowly but surely, every like couple minutes, just check on it, save and run. You can come back here, check between this screen and your minor status screen, and double check everything on a regular basis. So you can do this daily, weekly. So let's go ahead and pull one of these hash boards out and I'll show you how to hook up the test fixture and then we'll go over the uh, pit kit. So you can just unplug it. So they come out from the back side here. Going to have to disconnect all the cables to the hash boards. The newer models actually have a power rail instead of these cables here. It's also attached to the actual unit. It's better to use a screwdriver kit than an actual impact wrench because you can over torque these. Yeah, there's just four screws that you remove. Now you wouldn't want to do this if it was still under warranty because I would have just broke the warranty sticker. So now the fan comes off and if everything's disconnected, you can just slide the hash port out. So on the L3s, as you can see, there's no back heat sinks, but there's front heat sinks. So it's also important when you're testing these uh, hash boards, especially the newer units, 
that you have a fan going. Uh, they actually started separating the uh, test fixture into what they call PT1, PT2 testing, which is basically with pattern test or without pattern test. And so PT1 basically it just sees if the ASICs are there. From there, then it go, goes ahead and tries to run the algorithm, checking the nonce of all the chips. And when it does that, it heats up the board. So you want to make sure that it has fans on it. Um, especially the newer models, you're going to want to reattach the heat sinks and uh, the heat plate, whatever it uses to cool down the ASIC chips. Because if you have the heat sink off while you're putting it on a PT2 test, it can actually burn out that chip, and now you have more issues to deal with. And so with the test fixture, there's uh, basically two files, two to three files. The first file we do is kind of like flashing the control board like you just saw. It's very similar. We do the same process. The only difference is, is that we're using what's called a conversion file. So that's what converts the control board into being used as a test fixture. From there, we remove that, and then we insert another SD card that the control board runs off of. That way we can run the tester firmware. So when you're using the test fixture, whether it's the universal one, and this one's pretty much only for like SHA-256 algorithms, um, hashing boards. Uh, for like L3s, for example, you need a specific test fixture for those. It uses a completely different control board. It's actually a completely different algorithm. So it's running off of script um, versus the SHA algorithms. So uh, you can't use the universal test fixture on an L3. You need an L3 test fixture. Um, and then when you're installing uh, the software for your, uh, for your test fixture, the main ones that you're going to want is, is you're going to want a serial connector for your USB to TTL cable. Um, most common is like X-Shell or Putty or Termite. Um, and then you're also going to need uh, an actual um, software to be able to run that actual cable. So you have a program here. This one's prolific. So first you have to install that software to be able to connect your USB uh, cable. And then after that, you can set up XShell. Now when you're setting up XShell, this one's already set up, but you can come in here into properties. So basically you just go to file new and you'd be doing exactly what I'm about to show you here. So you can name it whatever you'd like. I just named it test fixture. You wanna go ahead and switch it to serial. So now that it's in serial, you can go into our login you want to make sure that it goes to 115200. And again with serial. So what you're going to do is, is on the baud rate, you want to also make sure it's 115200. And this goes for both uh, all, all the test fixtures uh, that you see here. So these are the same exact settings. The other thing you want to do is, is make sure you set the port to the right port. As you can see here, now it's COM5. 
You can also verify that in your settings on what's connected. Sometimes you have to reinstall the software. It's a little finicky sometimes. So it looks like it's not showing up. So what we're going to have to do is you can either try restarting it or just reinstall the firmware or the software rather and you just repair it. Unfortunately, we got to restart the computer, so. What's that? Um, yeah, I mean, most of the time when you purchase them, it comes with them. Uh, you can also go to the Bitmain training and get them as well. Uh, I don't think they're necessarily open source. <laughs> um, I was just in the back. I can't really hear what he's saying. Do you mind when he when someone asks? Do you mind speaking? Gotcha. About that? Everything's going to start popping up now. <laughs> but yeah, you see it here now. So we'll go back into Excel, go quickly back over the settings. So we make sure that's in serial. We set the terminal speed. We set the baud rate. We connect it to the right port. Then you just hit OK. Now you just connect it. Now, as you can see, it's connected. Otherwise, it would say failed. So we have the L3 test fixture here. We're going to go ahead and power it on. <laughs> so now it's just booting up. So it's actually trying to look for Ethernet, but it doesn't need it. You don't need to connect it. We have the login screen here. So for like the L3s, for example, you want to go ahead and type in roots and enter. If you don't, everything's going to come out all jarbled on the screen. Um, so you want to make sure to type that in and press enter. That way it makes everything nice and neat on the left side there for you. So you also need a data cable.
You want to make sure that it's on the first chain, whether that's chain zero or chain one. You can tell that by what the numbers are by the actual ports. They're, it's pretty small, you might need a magnifying glass. Now we have actually these fans hooked up to some S9 control boards, seems kind of convenient. The other trick is, is that you can just move that JP4 pin over like you're trying to flash it and just leave it like that. It actually turns the fans on pretty high. So it's also good to have a switch where you can actually turn on and off the power. So that way if something happens, it short happens, you can just have a switch right here. You don't actually have to touch the electricity. You don't get shocked or all that good stuff. Especially when working with power supplies, hash boards aren't, you know, quite as bad because of low voltage. But uh, when you start getting the alternating current, it's another, completely another ball game. So just be careful. Yeah, so on the, oh, gonna get some wind here. But you only need uh, one power cable uh, for these units, S9s, L3s. You don't need to plug in all two or all three. You just need one to, for just for the testing. Um, so we're not actually gonna be pushing it through all the whole amp that it can pull. So we have one power cable and the data cable. They're both connected. And now what we do is, is we hit the test button. Now, as you can see, it shows 72 ASICs. So now it's gonna go ahead and start the uh, second level testing. So the board's actually getting hot. And it's basically checking the temperature and the nonce of every single chip. So we're going to take a look here. So the results here, we can see that all of the chips actually uh, performed well. All the nonces are at level, it's supposed to be 96, and all the chips are. Um, if it was not uh, showing the correct nonce, it would actually be showing right below here. Now it looks like we're having some temperature issues. So what it says here is, is that the temperature sensor is no good, but the pattern is okay. As we can see here, the pattern came out just fine. Usually you want to test it a few times. So if it doesn't show all 72 ASIC on the L3 tester, it'll actually shut it off and it won't go, uh, continue on the pattern two test.
Now you want to make sure that this temperature doesn't rise too high. Um, it can hit like 70, 80. Technically, according to the manufacturers, depends on the board, of course. It can actually go upwards of 105, but I wouldn't want to get in that hot. So we're having the same result here. Of course, this board was just hashing away for us, so. It's also why you also want to test it. We call it age testing. So if it passes the test fixture, we would then throw it on to a machine to make sure that it's all hashing properly. So that's pretty much how you would use a test fixture. Now while, while you hit the test button, you can actually come in with your multimeter and after you hit the test button, you can test all those test points. Um, so you want to make sure you're checking, uh, you know, the voltage that's coming in. You want to make sure those circuits are good because otherwise, obviously, the other chips are not going to be working. Um, you also want to make sure that the signals are flowing. Uh, most of the signals go from first chip to last chip. There's usually one signal that goes from the last chip to first chip, and that's the one that returns all the information, including the temperature data. Um, so if this board is actually having some temperature sensor issues, it could be pretty much anything in between all that. Um, generally what you'd want to do is probably reflow that area of the, uh, of the temperature sensor. Um, just really depends on the situation. Um, you can also test like the return signal, make sure all the voltages are running properly. One of the chips might actually be a little bit lower of a voltage, but it's still flowing through the chip. So it's still showing, you know, all ASICs, but one of the chips is actually causing the issue. Um, if you find out that like the whole domain has similar problems on all the chips in that same row or column, you want to go ahead and test the LDOs on that, uh, on that domain, make sure that the proper voltages are there. Um, usually that's what will go out. They'll take out that whole domain. But yeah, as you're using the test fixture, you just want to make sure you're touching the test points. Depends on the model you're working on. Like the 17 series, they literally just give you like, I don't know, three seconds to be able to see what the actual voltage is. And then you got to hit the test button again. Uh, this one here, you can actually go for almost two minutes and still continue testing without having to hit the button again. Uh, we'll go ahead and show you the pit kit. So for the pit kit, we just need uh, this software right here. It's made by MP Lab, and it's the IPE. You also want to make sure that you have a USB port that is a 3.0, so you need to be supplying power to your pit kit. And this would be it right here. So you have one arrow right here, and that's gonna be where your ground is. It also is a square on that five pin we showed you earlier on the slide. So you wanna make sure that you put that on the ground where the arrow is. And you also wanna make sure that there's nothing connected to the board, there's no power going to the board when you do this, because you're actually supplying the voltage to the pick via the pick kit. So when you normally come here, you won't see all this stuff. You'll actually have to come up here um, and actually select uh, advanced mode under settings. And once you get there, it actually tells you what the default password is. It's a microchip. You wanna make sure to click that box to make sure that you don't have to keep logging in every single time you enter into the uh, application here. Now you also wanna take note Uh, right here where the device is. 
So you actually have to read the um, coding on the actual chip that you're trying to read. So with this one, it's PIC 16 F 1704 or 1705. And you wanna make sure that you Click on it from the drop down menu. Hit apply. And then you want to go ahead and connect to your pick kit. So now you can go into here to power. You want to make sure that you're powering the target circuit from the pick kit 3. And depending upon what USB 3.0 you have, um, you want to make sure to set that voltage to meet that. You obviously can't try to get more voltage when it doesn't have it. So this one, it's very common. It's usually about 4.75. You can also sometimes get a use by using the low voltage programming but that's if you uh, don't have enough voltage. So under the production, we want to make sure that all these are checked. You also want to make sure that you allow uh, to export the hex as well as import. So just make sure all these check boxes are where uh, you see them here. And these are the proper settings that you want to use. Make sure I'm using the right pick kit here. Yeah, 1704. So now what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna connect it where the arrow is to the square box uh, plug-in right here. So now it's inserted. You just wanna make sure there's good connection. So you can either let it hang with the weight or put your finger there to kind of make sure there's good contact. Now what you can do is, is that you can read it. These are the pretty much the two that you wanna use, read and program. So you can read the PIC information. You wanna make sure that you're using the same board. Um, we've actually gone down to you know the actual version and all that good stuff, but um, you really only need to make sure that it's the same uh, um, model number as well as uh, uh, The, um, the version model is not too much as important. You want to be sure not to erase it. Now, you can also go and browse your hex files that you already saved, and you can actually uh, upload them onto the PIC. So instead of having to go and hunt down that board, uh, you already saved it to file, you can go ahead and, and uh, re-upload it so you don't have to, like I said, hunt down that board again, pull the PIC information, and so that way you can reflash the pick. So we'll go ahead and read this one. So now it says read complete. And now once it's read, we can come over here to file export. You click on hex. And now you can name it whatever you'd like to name it. And then once it's saved, um, or if you just pulled it off the board, it's still within the memory. So now what you can do is, is let's say uh, I have a, a similar board. Now I can just connect it to that board. And then you just hit the program button. And now programming is complete. So now we just go uh, officially read the PIC information and we reprogrammed it. And we're kind of running out of time here, but uh, I can kind of go over some of the tools really quickly. So like for the S19, for example, you're going to need this uh, resistor. It's either ceramic, usually. Um, you put it on the power supply to ground out power to ground. 
uh, while you're doing testing. Um, the reason for this is that way it can actually uh, release all that power after you're done doing the testing. Um, otherwise, you know, it's pulling too much amps that it shouldn't be. Um, but that's only for like the 19 series. Um, I think we also talked about the hash code editor. So this you can use to actually read and write uh, EEPROMs. It's also not recommended. It'll probably void your warranty. Uh, we got tin tools here, so these tin tools are used so that way if you have a brand new ASIC chip, you can put it in there and actually tin it or put solder on it before you actually uh, install it back on a, new, on a board. Uh, another good tool to have is, is like a, a temperature sensor, so that way you can see uh, anything that's overheating probably is causing a short, so you just replace that component. Um, we got what's called solder mask here. So what you can do with this is if you accidentally scratch the PCB, you can put that back over it so that way you're not causing shorts um, when you're trying to re-solder. Uh, that is actually activated by UV light, so you need to have a UV light to be able to activate that. Um, oscilloscope, those are always nice. Uh, this one's a portable one. You can also get a bench top one. Um, it's always good to also have all these different kind of meters so you can actually measure the decibel sound, you can actually test for, you know, the temperature with the laser pointer kind of thing. You also want to make sure what the airflow is. So let's say, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you have good airflow going into the miners, that way they're not overheating. Um, same thing with the uh, exhaust. Um, I think we actually kind of cut out on the uh, environmental slide, but um, yeah, environment's a very important thing when it comes to mining. Um, that's usually uh, the root of most of your problems. Uh, it's also good to have, uh, you know, the parts. We also offer parts. We have parts kits. This is a boost kit. So you can use this kit right here and you can literally uh, just replace all the components on the boost circuit, for example. Um, Yeah, that's pretty much all the specialty tools. Um, one final thing I want to mention is, is when you're replacing the ASICs, you want to make sure that you test it uh, in what's called diode mode with your multimeter. Um, we're checking the resistance, uh, making sure that there's not too much solder uh, or there's not enough solder. You know, there's a short or an open circuit. Um, that way you test all the test points before you even remove the chip and you also test it after. That way you can verify, um, you know, maybe the chip wasn't fully seated, maybe it was a cold joint, so um, that way it just needs a reflow. So you just reflow it. You can also do what's called uh, reseating it, so then instead of just heating it up, letting the solder melt again in place with some flux, you literally just remove the chip, place it right back down, and then obviously you can replace it. And that'll be the final step. Yeah, that pretty much uh, wraps up this uh, presentation. Uh, I think we're gonna move on over to Q&A. And uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. And